essere qui con noi, è la seconda conferenza che facciamo qui a San Sebastiano dopo quella di ieri ed è, rientra nel ciclo dedicato alla nuova architettura messicana curato da Francesca Serrazanetti. Questa seconda tornata, in realtà questo pomeriggio è già cominciato con una conferenza di Fernanda Canales alla Casa del Mantegna alle ore 15 e oggi introdotti appunto anche da lei che ha preparato, che ha curato non solo la eh, sua conferenza con le sue opere ma anche la parte introduttiva storica sulla nuova sull architettura moderna messicana per la mostra e per il numero di Casabella di maggio che ieri abbiamo avuto in anteprima, lo ricordo, penso che adesso sia in edicola per tutti, ma ieri è appunto uscito in anteprima Mantova qui, qui per noi, numero di maggio di Casabella dedicato alla nuova architettura messicana curato da Francesca Serrazanetti che mette in evidenza, insomma, anzi approfondisce, vorrei dire, alcuni materiali che abbiamo già eh, esposto nella mostra e poi soprattutto le conferenze che i nostri amici, i nostri architetti hanno presentato ieri e presenteranno dunque oggi. Dicevo per chi è stato ieri all'inaugurazione della mostra avete visto c'erano dieci studi accomunati dalla essere della stessa generazione degli anni eh, 70, accomunati anche da un buon vincolo e legame di amicizia come anche loro tengono sempre a eh, esprimere, accomunati da eh, delle, delle questioni di architettura molto importanti, le abbiamo viste anche adesso oggi pomeriggio, Fernanda Canales ce l'ha mostrata in modo molto evidente, eh, emergenze che riguardano appunto eh, particolari quartieri, particolari territori in cui il ruolo dell'architetto si assume quella responsabilità sociale fondamentale e particolare poi in, una, in un luogo di quel genere, insomma temi che comunque sono di tutto il mondo, quindi ci fa piacere, si diceva ieri il Presidente dell'Ordine degli Architetti di Mantova, Valenti parlava appunto di architettura lontana, certo un'architettura lontana, però come diceva lui stesso molto vicina per i temi che trattiamo, in Italia parliamo di periferie, qui si parla appunto di luoghi particolari, di una metropoli di 20 milioni di abitanti come quella di Città del Messico. Bene, eh, poi dopo avremo tempo anche oggi, qualche tempo per le domande che ieri abbiamo un po' chiuso e quindi direi di dare il benvenuto qui con noi, chiamo prima Fernanda Canales per l'introduzione e poi do il eh, benvenuto questa sera, ti puoi accomodare qui, questa sera a Manuel Cervantes e all'Atelier Ars che oggi questa sera è rappresentato da Alejandro Guerrero, Alessandro noi diciamo, Guerrero e che comunque, comunque fa parte dell'atelier Ars. Un applauso a loro. Cedo la parola a Fernanda Canales, ringraziandola anche di aver accettato non solo il ruolo di conferenziera, ma anche il ruolo di quelli che introduce di solito sono i nostri docenti, però ti consideriamo una nostra collega, professor. Thank you. Grazie, thank you very much. Once again, Federico, which it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, all of you here present. Um, for me, it's an honor to present two of my um, most admired uh, colleagues and contemporary and architects and friends, Manuel Cervantes and Ars Atelier. Ars Atelier is a firm um, made by Alejandro Guerrero and Andrea Soto. They are from Guadalajara. Alejandro Guerrero was born in 1977, as well as Manuel Cervantes. Andrea Soto is almost 10 years younger. But uh, in a way, I think their work depicts two realities, two very different versions of same interests, but also two different realities, one located in Guadalajara and one in Mexico City. Ars Atelier, uh, they're situated in Guadalajara, which is um, more traditional uh, city with a human scale. Uh, it's about four million inhabitants. And Mexico City, which is the central capital, has almost 20 million inhabitants. So for me, it's a lesson, and you will be able to see it today, of two different approaches regarding very different cities. They're two of the most important cities in our country, 
two of the, the biggest cities, and they have very different traditions. Their, their work is both based on a very detailed and refinement, a care for craft, a care for local work, and for traditional local materials, but you can see very different visions one that comes from the tradition of Guadalajara School of Architecture, specifically of the ITESO, which is the University of the Young Generation of Architects, as Macias Paredo, the lecture that Maggie Paredo uh, gave yesterday. And there's a, a group, at least we see them in that way, from Mexico City. We see um, a very consolidated team, even though they are all working independently, but it's, it's a very particular way of approaching architecture that has to do with the lessons of the university, but also with the architects that were uh, very famous in the 50s in Guadalajara, which they combine a knowledge of um, technical methods and building construction always uh, trying to um, search new ways of uh, building with um, high techniques, but also very local crafts, and um, um, search for a, a richness of textures, of a relationship with nature, very strong relationship between interior spaces and exterior spaces. And then we have the different view of a Mexico City, which is um, more cosmopolitan view, I would say, of a city, and even though both firms have approached um, different scales in their work, for example, I think they both have worked with um, countryside uh, houses or houses in tropical settings, as well as mixed-use buildings or marketplaces or also industrial buildings. So it's, it's um, a new generation working on same themes, but with uh, very particular uh, ways, both related also with the same interests as many of the firms that you can see in the exhibition, that in a way try to figure out different ways of balancing uh, the contrast we have in the country, but also the enormous knowledge of the local crafts and provide an understanding of opening up architecture into the site. They're very, um, there's architecture that's closely related with the exterior space and involves vegetation in a very exuberant manner. You, I think it's better if you see the work directly and um, themselves explain it to you. But for me, it's important to relate it to the other firms the uh, examples that you can also see in the Casabella issue, because uh, there are many um, different issues that are, are always uh, in hand in these offices, and it's part of the generation that is working uh, with friendship, but also competing against each other. They're like, um, we say we have a very promiscuous uh, relationship between these offices because they're always helping each other, but as well, uh, sometimes you're on the other side in a commission or um, sharing clients or competing against the same clients. So it's an interest, uh, interesting way to find a generation that uh, is very consolidated as a group and has strong relationships, uh, friendship relationships, but also are uh, trying to find each their own way and their different uh, approaches and individual personalities that you will see reflected in these two lectures and that you can see also with the different projects. Uh, so I think they portray the richness of a new generation in Mexico. And you can see the diversity and the plurality of the scope of work of um, uh, the office of Alejandro and Andrea is uh, 20 years uh, since they began working. Manuel Cervantes has been practicing for uh, most, more than 15 years and they have consolidated their own practices being some of the most important firms in the country and uh, in Latin America. You can say that if you compare them with the rest of the firms in the world. 
So I'd like to, to welcome Alejandro Guerrero, and thank you all very much. Sorry, it's Manuel Cervantes is first. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, everyone, and I would like to say thank you to Francesca Serrazanetti, the, the architect that made this possible. And, um, okay, there we go. Uh, well, I think that the Fernanda's introduction was amazing. I, I think that I, I don't need to explain a lot of things that I have in mind. Uh, and understanding that, I, I, I will jump into the presentation of uh, several projects that we have been doing for the last few, uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm not showing the, the, like the, the whole uh, body of work at the office. I, I'm showing 10 years, uh, 10 years that are like uh, the period of the office since uh, uh, since uh, the last uh, economical crisis that we had uh, back in 2008, uh, and it was a time when 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 we discover the need of understanding how to find uh, different ways to get commissions. So, in in this period of time, we have been doing. Uh, projects with different approaches and different interests and and I will show uh, not in a chronological way but in in a, in a matter of understanding how we understand uh, site cities people and and how we try to develop architecture so in a way right now I think that the most important thing at the office is the understanding of how architecture, it's about celebrating human life. So the human and site experience, it's the, the most important thing for us when we start uh, a process. Because in a way, I think that humans and, and site are, are the most important elements on, on, on the idea of how can we start the projects understanding site and probably a sculpting site. So, with these sketches, I I try to to imagine uh, an idea. Octavio Paz has this uh, concept of how the Mexican culture is a cortex uh, between the underground and the above, uh, between the sky and the earth, and and how our our personal stories. Uh, developed in this in this cortex again. So, for me, that's the architecture, uh, that situation between the elements that we have above and the elements that we have on the ground, and then especially in, in cities like Mexico City, that we have like a, a very complex situation because we we used to be a lake and now we are a 21 million mex uh, uh, metropolis. Uh, the, the, the complexity of all those factors are crucial for us at the beginning of every process. So understanding that, and, and again with this image, understanding that, that the human in, 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 in his context uh, and the human surrounded by these elements, it's our, like, like our main goal. And now I, I now I, I will talk about, like I, I was saying, about different projects in order to explain the concepts that are pretty relevant for us. The persistence obviously gives us the understanding of a city that it's not like Mantova. Uh, we don't have that, that uh, long period heritage, but, but we are, I must say, a, a, a very old, city in America, and to understand a city that sometimes doesn't remember how important is the persistence of things, is that we start this simple project in downtown Mexico, 
It's a 200 years old building that was totally abandoned and totally destroyed. In a way, uh, like I was saying, society sometimes for, forget the idea or the importance of, of, or the relevance of the idea of, preser of preservation, in a way. So, uh, with this kind of projects, we approach uh, in a very subtle way. We try to understand our, our, our short period of time in, in life, in, in, in a city's life. So, we decide to, to work for this kind of projects in a subtle way. So the persistence give us the understanding of, of maybe old uh, construction elements or construction um, uh, processes, uh, and, and, and also to understand the persistence of intangible things like light. So in this exercise, again, it was an idea just to be subtle to understand our scale in history, our scale in time, and, and, and how we need to think about cities, about heritage, and not about us. Because another thing that I always say at the office is that we don't need to prove anything when we do a project. We need to prove uh, in time uh, our way of thinking but again, this project was intended to be something very, very subtle and something for the city and, and not for us as architects trying to scream. Obviously, we learn a, a lot of things in, in this process. We learn a, a, a lot about, again, uh, old construction systems or, or old techniques that in further projects you will see that, that we implement. After this uh, project and with the crisis, we started uh, with huge uh, urban transit transportation projects, uh, subway stations. Uh, obviously, the, the scale of the office changed at that time. Uh, and we decide to approach this project's understanding another important thing. Uh, a, a culture uh, and, a, and an economic country like Mexico needs to, to be uh, developed by, by a society that understands the complexity of, of economical factors, of uh, social elements and, and not only architecture. So we decided to approach uh, a problem that is the, the urban uh, migration that we have daily. Fernanda was saying that we are almost at 22 million inhabitants, but the thing is that we are not that. We are only a 9 million uh, people city with the surrounding areas of the city that are part of another uh, entity, uh, we, we have the sum of that people. And we have this, again, urban daily migration that creates a, a very, very complex situation because we have 11 million people commuting every day uh, and, and uh, creating a chaos uh, surrounding that. So. Uh, the idea of, of thinking as, uh, as how architecture can understand, like I was saying, s social uh, or, or urban things, is that we start these this projects that are hubs, commuting places between uh, uh, subway and, and other kind of transportations. And this is the actual uh, state of these are 49 places, stations all over the city, and, and this is the, the actual uh, state of, of almost all these uh, uh, hubs. And there is also the understanding of how our society works, of how 
we have a, a, a very complex society that lives between contrast and, and lives between, uh, a, I don't know how to say it, but a, a, I don't know how to say it even in Spanish. So, But well, we're a society with a lot of heritage, with a lot of uh, problems and, and with a lot of uh, differences. And sometimes this is our daily basis image. And, and understanding what I was saying about all this urban migration and stuff and understanding our, our culture is that we decide to, to, to think in a more pragmatic way, in a more rational way in order to create a simple architecture, simple construction systems and, 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 and the idea of, of, of an architecture that doesn't need to, again, prove anything, just uh, to create atmospheres for, for these kind of purposes, and, and to understand how we design in order to build. Uh, ten years ago that we started with this kind of projects, we understood that in an economical uh, society like Mexico is, uh, it's difficult not to think on how to design buildings that need the capacity to defend themselves in the process of construction. Uh, the capacity of clients trying to get rid of stuff because economical uh, understandings or because uh, construction systems ideas. So in a way, these buildings are intended to be, again, very, very simple, very, very pragmatic, and, and with the idea that a society needs rational buildings if the economy doesn't have uh, the capacity to create these uh, amazing buildings or, or infrastructures that sometimes countries like, well, like Mexico with, with with the, the airport that we were trying to build with, with Norman Foster that now is uh, cancelled. But again, the idea of how we create projects for a society, for an economy, for a country, and, and, and for, for, a, for, a, for a situation and a site. So, After, after that pragmatic idea and the, the first one that it was uh, persistence, this uh, third element of, of the office is, is something more beautiful, I must say, uh, and it's about uh, the, the commissions that we have uh, that give us the opportunity to be uh, more I must say, uh, uh, free. And with the idea of understanding our relationship with landscape. This is the, the simple Wikipedia definition of landscape. But for me, the important thing is to understand the word region. And like Fernanda was saying, for me, and I think that for most of, of the architects of my generation in Mexico, it's very important to understand uh, our situation, our culture, our sites. We have very different and beautiful uh, sites in, in Mexico and, and four different climate with several different subclimates. And, and the understanding of that the understanding of, of what's a landscape that sometimes is a beautiful mountain or, or, a, or a beautiful valley, or in this case, a beautiful lake. This is not Mexico, this is Tigensi next to Munich. It's our, our first project here in Europe. And also the idea of how human, uh, human beings can, can uh, relate themselves with, with, a, with a landscape. No, this is uh, Switzerland and, and Heidegger on the right. Uh, probably everyone knows about the story of, of the Heidegger cabin. Uh, but again, 
living in a city like Mexico City, for us, the, 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 the countryside, it's about ourselves in another space. So for me, it's very important when we design a project, uh, how we are thinking on, on several elements that I will explain, but, but how we create spaces for all these people that are trying to get rid of the daily basis uh, elements in a city. So topography and, and, and landscape, it's sometimes uh, the most important thing. Sometimes we try to disappear architecture, sometimes we try to integrate architecture uh, in a way how uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was always thinking about uh, architecture. And again, with, with the, the, the subtleness idea of how we worked on, on the pre-existence projects at the city is again that we try, like in here, sometimes to disappear the architecture and not to be uh, intrusive in the landscape, but, but with the idea of creating this, you know, creating architecture that is like almost part of the landscape or that sometimes disappears in the landscape. Other smaller projects that are these cabins that we have sometimes in our minds, these uh, simple, sometimes pragmatic structures that again relate the people or the story of the people inside these places to site. In this case, this is a project, uh, an equestrian project. And again, it shows our idea of how the, the, the simple action on topography can create the space, can uh, define the gesture of the project and, and, and how we can be, again, subtle and, and simple. And, and with just, again, simple, gestures or, or, or ideas, uh, we can create like strong uh, relationships or strong spaces. And with the idea of, of how we relate uh, the human experience in different scales and, and different relationships with, with, with sight, you no? Know? Like in here, for me, this, this is a a beautiful picture of how the, the equestrian scale, the human scale, the relationship with the site and, and the relationship with different uses uh, can be beautiful and not only programmatic or, or simple. And these are more examples of ongoing projects that are uh, intended to understand this cabin, this idea of sight, this idea of, of how we integrate our, our projects into, into landscape. And in this case, it's also important to understand that landscape can be also uh, an urban or a rural uh, context. And, and in this case, this is this uh, uh, Tegensee uh, town in the south of Munich. And, and, and how it's about sometimes to relate to this kind of landscape, the landscape of, of, of an existence uh, or, or a pre-existence in, in, in another culture. So in, in the same path, talking about these uh, like countryside projects, the materiality and, and the constructiveness of of our projects, like I was saying, it's, it's very important because with these kind of things, we relate our clients, we relate the people that will create their, their personal experiences to the site and, and the, 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 if not culture, the, the, the materiality of the site. So, Again, with the idea of, of how can you create a relationship with material and, and, and other elements 
uh, between our, our mind and, and, and our relationship with sight, it's, it's in, in a way the most important part because again for us it's, it's not about how it looks but how it, it feels to be in a, in a space and how again we relate with that. And constructiveness is also very important uh, because again, we're always fighting with budgets, we're only, always fighting with time. So like in, 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 in the big scale project that I was talking about earlier, uh, in here it's about how we build things and how we use simple techniques uh, and, and, and simple uh, construction um, processes in order to create the atmosphere. Now we try again to, to be honest in, in a Semperian way uh, because I think that if you are honest with the materials that you use and the materials that you use are from the region, you, you end up having that connection that is important. Now, so, so atmospheres for us are intended to be very, very site-specific. Now, for me, it's important to go to the countryside and, and, and smell the materials and, and, and touch the materials that talks about the region. So all these images of different projects in, in the countryside are intended to understand that. Now, these pictures are more intended to understand the constructiveness, but in this case, and, and imagining the atmosphere, uh, the final result, I think that it's about what I, I'm saying, you know? this idea of, of relationship and, and, and sight the specific uh, sensations. Uh, Fernanda was talking also about our interest in, 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 the, in the vegetation, in, in how we integrate interior and exterior uh, with landscape. So as you can see in these pictures, for us landscape, it's, it's part of architecture. We, we don't divide that in, in two different uh, uh, professional matters. For us, it's part of the, of the same idea because we start sometimes doing landscape or sometimes it's that we end up doing landscape. So, so that relationship on these kind of projects, sometimes the, the most fascinating part of the process. Or in this case, that we relate ourselves to, to another kind of architecture, uh, the Bavarian idea of, of old towns in that region uh, well, with the same spirit that we use in, in, in our country. Uh, now uh, I'm going to show you some uh, projects that are, three are in the city and the other one is outside the city, but I think that are related because these projects are part of our understanding of how uh, houses but also working spaces needs to understand the, the, the concept of, of intimacy, of, of coziness. And, and, and this, is a, this is a description uh, by a, in, an exhibition of Luis Barragan in, in New York and Ambas was, was referring to, to the idea of how Barragan was uh, creating a process of discovering in order to get to the experiences. But this is a very uh, traditional way of thinking. Uh, I think that it was not Barragan discovering nothing was, that he was uh, like uh, remembering or imagining the, the, the great places of, of his trips in order again to, to understand uh, the idea of privacy and, 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 and coziness. So these are like different uh, simple uh, analyses of, of architectures that are uh, intended to be like that, to, to, to create this kind of beautiful private spaces 
in patios or in gardens. And finally, the, 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 the Barragan result of, of all this understanding that for, I think that for my age, it, it's the most important influence in our country. This is his house, and, and this is the, again, the analysis of, of how everything, it's about those exterior spaces, and, and, and these, uh, I must say, sometimes oniric places that bring us uh, a lot of stuff. So these different houses are thinking with, with the same idea of, of how we eliminate the city, how we eliminate our relationship with the chaos of the city, and how we create internal uh, worlds, how we uh, create uh, spaces for our families, for our, our, our personal stories. You know, Barragan uh, always said that modernity destroyed uh, the personal space in, in cities because of these huge glasses as, as, as the idea of modernity. You know? Instead of that, he was uh, proposing and, and, and designing spaces uh, intended to be more intimate and more uh, introspective in a way. So this is an ongoing project uh, that, that talks about, again, several of the concepts that I was talking about, uh, the, the, some, sometimes the pragmatism, uh, the, the materiality, the constructiveness, uh, but the, the idea of, of, of the patio and the relationship between interior and exterior. And again, the idea of, of, of how you design spaces for the families to create personal stories. You know? Another house in the city that with the same idea create this uh, I think beautiful uh, spaces, uh, beautiful uh, sometimes contemplation spaces, but, but sometimes uh, 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 transitorios, uh, transitional spaces. And, and with also with all this uh, understanding of, of, of how sometimes landscape, smell, uh, and, and, and in, the, the introspective spaces can create memories, no? In this case, this garden was intended to create uh, the, the memory of an entrance, no? The, the memory of how you react in time with, 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 the, with, the, with the, the memories of, 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 of your house and the smell of your house. So, atmospheres like, again, that are related to this idea. This is another one, also in the city, with the same, uh, the same understanding, the same uh, idea of how we relate to local materials, to, to materials that are part of the history of a place. And with a simple uh, goal, the simple idea of, of that, that, that architecture is about this, no? Uh, this, for me, this is a very important picture because it gets the, 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 the result of, of what, what I imagine when I design stuff, no? It's not about uh, pictures like this one that is beautiful. Uh, it's about this, no? We tend to photograph buildings without people and, and, and without this, uh, like, daily basis stuff, but for me it's about this. And again, the relationship uh, with uh, constructiveness, materiality, and, and simple but beautiful moments. Private moments or, or public moments. And in this case, like I was saying, this is a not a public, but it, it's, an, an, it's an office space, and it's, an, uh, it's more uh, extrovertido. Uh, and 
but it works on the same idea, on, on the idea of, of, of a series of volumes that gather around the patio, that gather around the common area of the office space, and, and, and with the, the final goal of, of celebrating uh, human contact, human experience, and, and in the case of an office, uh, the idea of, of interaction between uh, different of di different levels at the at the social at the office uh, program and understanding all of that this is the last uh, concept and it's a it's a it's a, a, a series of, of houses that we have been developing. Uh, first, we started with the government, with Infonavit, that is the, the authority in charge of, of, of housing projects in, in the country, uh, but also with another private association called Piensa Sostenible. And, and for the last years, we have been doing and developing and also building small houses uh, that are connected with all the elements that I already explained. No, the, these are pictures of, of I, must, I, I think, tectonic ideas, uh, the tectonic on the, on the left and, and, and the stereotomic on the right, but this, this, these are uh, vernacular projects in, in Mexico or other parts of the world. But this is, this is the image of our old towns. And these are the images of the real families that we are working with. And, and these three different uh, families explain us that when a society decides to uh, build or design uh, houses for, for families, they always decide that a family is a traditional heterosexual couple with kids. Uh, and obviously that's totally wrong. No, we have three simple samples here. Uh, we have a, a heterosexual uh, couple, we have grandparents with grandsons, and we have a single mother with her kids and, 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 and uh, sorry, I don't remember what was the relationship of Emma with, with the other kids. Uh, but the thing is that because of the situation all over the world, but especially in Mexico, the situation about uh, uh, m migration between Mexico and, and the United States, but also between South Amer Central and South America to the States, uh, families are totally different today. Families are um, integrated by different uh, situations, and, and we still in the process of designing houses for the traditional families. So, in a way, we have been creating this. We have been creating generic and sometimes ridiculous ideas of a house. And I think that it's because we, we don't have the opportunity and we don't have the time uh, to spend quality time with the families and, and quality time with architects and authorities to understand single cases, specific cases, uh, and, and site-specific cases, no? So, we have been working in, in six or eight projects. These are four uh, different uh, small houses that I think that explain the whole thing that I was uh, explaining with the other projects. This is a, like a condensation of, of, of the ideas. And these are four projects in four different climates, mountain, warm, subtropical, desert, and tropical. Everything is in Mexico, but like I was saying, we have, we have a huge variety of, of, of climates and, and, and sites. This is a, a, the, the mountain case. And as you can see, the, the idea of how you design a house that it's intended to be constructed by the family, it's not intended to be a construction from a, a, a big 
construction company. It's about how we show them how to build their houses in order to spread the idea of how architecture needs to be in a place. So you can see again, like I was saying, the tectonic, the, 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 the regional materiality, the eco techniques and the, the, the simpleness and pragmatic pragmatic idea of, of design. So we, we try to use uh, simple construction uh, uh, systems to avoid uh, the traditional uh, process of, of using uh, wood and then pour concrete, then destroy the wood. And, and, and that, that common process for us that, that in this case, for these houses that are uh, uh, 12,000 euros uh, are, are very important. No, every detail counts in, in, a, in a budget like this. So again, mountain, uh, a, a section that explains how, how to treat light, how to treat the water, how to treat the materiality. And, and how we relate again with, with the site, how we relate with, a, with local materiality. No, a simple project with the same approach that creates the same idea of a personal and beautiful life. Uh, for me, it's important to understand that these kind of projects that are for very, very poor people are almost the same that the projects that we create for our rich clients. Uh, it's obviously not the same cost, it's not the same uh, um, result, but I think that it's the same spirit, it's the same uh, human experience that is uh, happy in a way. In this case, this is San Mateo del Mar, Oaxaca. Uh, it's a place between the ocean and a lagoon. It's a very, very complicated place because sometimes you, you have the, the wind uh, and, and sand and sometimes water passing from the, from the ocean to the, to the lagoon. So it's an elevated house with, with the capacity of a cross ventilation uh, architecture. It's a house that is related uh, to their, their garden that they use, like, uh, as you can see, to produce what they, they eat and, and, and what they sell. And again, uh, a simple architecture that tries to relate uh, to, to a family, to a place, and to an economical position. Another one, that this is not built yet, on the desert, Ciudad uh, Lerdo Durango, that is in, in, in the north of the country, uh, next to, to the states. And, and with the idea, again, of a simple structure that with simple eco techniques can bring the people uh, a, a, a better place to live in, in the desert. And finally, um, another house in uh, Palenque, uh, this is a tropical climate, it's, it's a, again a, a site uh, or a house that needs to understand how water passing uh, under, underneath the, the house, the cross ventilation system, the, the pitch roof to get the water out of the house, and the understanding of, of, of families that are like this, no families that uh, have the, the, the relationship with the, the, with the animals and, and, and we all, with other realities and, and, and with the idea of creating, again, houses for site, for a region, but for a family and, and their economical capacities. So thank you very much.
a Terry Ars che non solo sono eh, qui con noi, solamente loro due, ma anche un er l'erede che ha, eh, quanti anni ha? No, neanche un anno penso, che ha fatto un giro nel Tempio di San Sebastiano, li sta aspettando fuori, quindi devono fare velocemente a presentare tutta la vostra opera perché la bambina Natalia vi aspetta fuori. Quindi ci vediamo alle 8 comunque, abbiamo, abbiamo alle 7, scusate, abbiamo tempo. Prego. Benissimo. Well, uh... Thank you, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I know this is a, this is a very important cycle here in uh, Mantova, extraordinary city. So we, are, we, we, f we feel very happy to be here. It's um, sad that we, we don't have uh, Francesca Sarasanetti with us today. We met her uh, and we We get to know our projects together and we talk a lot of things with her. So she's a responsible, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Bucci uh, for this invitation. Uh, thank you again. Um, we, we decided to, to name this uh, lecture Operative Dialectics because of our interesting relations of dialogue or contrast produced by sometimes opposite concepts and the synthesis produced by that interaction. For us, the possibility of the new is found in the, something that we call the hybrid condition of architecture. Uh, our process of working together, Andrea and I, is, a, a, is anchored in the idea of a conversation. We do not find uh, ideas uh, by drawing at last at the beginning of the process. We talk a lot, we always start with a conversation, sometimes very long, and we only draw something when we can say or describe an idea as complete as possible, uh, even to the level of being able of writing it down before drawing it. Uh, we want to start by showing you what uh, we understand as a hybrid With, um, with, this, uh, with this image. Uh, the hybrids could happen in many different ways. We want to manifest this process of mixing with a very well-known example, I suppose, for you as Italian architects, most of you. Uh, if you take the, par the Pantheon of Rome and a Greek temple, an example of a Greek, uh, a Greek temple, uh, in this case, the Temple of Apollo, Uh, and you overlap them, you can obtain a new synthesis. In this case, a formal achievement that led us in part to the theme of typology. Uh, but what happens when we try to mix two or more different forms? Here's an example of the concept of hybrid and transformation in architecture, at least uh, for us. Um, The plan, for example, the plan of the Altes Museum of Carl Friedrich Schinkel in Berlin reveals, among other things, the fact that you can understand the deep form of a building as the overlapping of two precedent buildings, the Pantheon contained into a Greek temple. In other words, in other words a semispherical, solid and closed space, a stereotomic building contained into a perimeter, open and tectonic structure. This dichotomy defines the two basic possibilities of architectural forms, structures defined by columns and beams, and, the, uh, and those defined by bearing walls. Or which is the same if, if we go back in history, a tectonic version of the primitive hut, as Loyer's uh, example, and a conical and, concent and concent concentric primitive hut, as Perrault's. So, having in mind uh, this idea of dialectics, we want to present our projects as a contrast between different concepts. So the next project is the first formal project in which we collaborated together. This client uh, planned to buy a property in a location of the city which is characterized by having dense vegetation. So when we visited the site, we, we thought of the existing house as a kind of exotic Mexican style, but we also realized that the site had a lot of potential. 
so we decided not to demolish the former structure in order to work with the idea of a preexistence. And we observed that in this place, arrival at the building implied an ascendant, an ascendant walk, uh, like a promenade, like in ancient temples of different times and cultures. And in fact, we remember Jörn Utzon's uh, text, Platforms and Plateaus, where he says that the platform as an architectural element is a fasc fascinating future. He says, I first fell in love with it in Mexico on a study trip in 1949, where I found many variations, both in size and idea. So we encourage our clients to conserve the existing building in order to reuse its original structure. We made only minor modifications and just added a new pavilion containing the entrance portico and a dining room. And in relation to the existing gardens, we propose to modify the topography, so making an ascendant promenade in it, to produce a sense of discovery when you were uh, arriving to the place through a new system of platforms. The pavilion was designed uh, using a modern grammar, but at the same time, um, it includes a system of concrete vaults as a reinterpretation of the traditional brick vaults from this specific region of Mexico. And sometimes we believe that we can start a project by designing just a part of it instead of beginning with a general approach. And many architects, Asian, modern, and contemporary, have worked with the, the classic subject of the corner of a building. This classic theme is one of the immutable issues of architecture, as the Swiss architect Livio Vacchini will say. The corner of a building is a constant reminder of the history in our discipline. And we like to think that it's possible to start a project thinking simultaneously the part and the whole of the project. This subject is reconsidering the structure of the new pavilion, where we join four steel beams in order to facilitate the possibility of relating two facades. The existing other walls, now plastered in white and the new structure, produce a particular atmosphere of contemporary and old elements. We consider this project as an example of reusing many levels, uh, reusing old structures, reusing old building systems, and transforming them in this new contemporary language. By building this first house together, we came across uh, on many themes that we consider to be fundamental for our practice. And then we are, we're continuously recalling, which is uh, historical elements, modern grammar, landscape promenades, and so on. So we recognize in the end two types of persistences the ones that are spatial and the ones that are historical. Spatial refers to the physical that is in a place, and historical, those matters relating to time, are the architectures of the past. And we believe that architecture must approach uh, both of them. As we can find physical preexistence in, in a place, it is also possible to find cultural preexistences. The following project helps us to understand a certain relation between theory and practice. And we consider this to be something important in, for, our, for our work. The idea of using textiles in a project um, came to us by reading some passage of the book The Four Elements of Architect in Architecture by Gottfried Semper, in which he mentions that in the primitive hut, the first wall or enclosures were made by weaving sticks. But we realized that we wanted to experiment with the idea of textile only when we witness the presence of that kind of craftsmanship in the place. That means for us that a theoretical thinking only takes relevance when we experience it personally in our, in our present and in, in our own reality. And by building this weekend house for an urban geographer in Chapala, which is near Guadalajara, we knew about this tradition when we saw people, people uh, weaving crafts like, like lamps, like hamacas, and other textile products all over that region. So we invited a fisherman from the region to help us with the textile facade, as he knew how to weave uh, with the branches of this tree, which is called Palo Dulce. And another important idea in this project was to build a house able to evoke the natural cycle of the site. 
This is why the roof of the house, just as the surrounding mountains uh, of the place, has the ability to collect rainwater and lead it down to the pavement of the reflecting uh, pool, which is just in, in the front enclosure. Therefore, during the rainy season, the rainwater is display in, displayed in the house and emerges from the ground just as it does in the surrounding landscape. The idea of a floating patio came to us by analyzing the geological history of that place, understanding that the lake was the result of a topographical system where the mountains irrigate and, and uh, flood the, the lower lands. The idea for the interior was to produce an ever-changing space by allowing the, the natural light to enter through the gaps in the roof of the house. And you can see the section in here where we show those, the gear there that allow this, um, the light to come into the house and, and those same gear there are the ones that collect the rainwater. The open condition of a space, the filter light between the gear there and the volcanic stone paving communicates the natural spirit of the interior space. We believe that the hybrid condition of this house consists in the possibility of producing a contemporary architecture using vernacular knowledge uh, through, a, but through a process of transformation. Um, we would like to we like to think, to think about the next project as our smallest project building ever made. Uh, I mean, a public building, uh, and the only one, in fact. During uh, 2015, I had the opportunity to work at the public space office at the interior of the municipality in Guadalajara, which is the city where, where we live. And my first commission was to design a newspaper kiosk, which is like very different, I believe. Um, at our discussions, Andrea and I immediately understood the commission as an opportunity to try to talk about identity. How can we design something to be repeatable all over the central areas of the city with the capacity to belong to, the, to, belong to it and at the same time to express something different or new. We found in the traditional ironworks the basic element to work with, as they are present in the whole city center, or as many other city centers, like in Mantova. We also found that the main monuments of the city, churches, government buildings, and so on, were made of the traditional golden stone, as it is known locally. Of course, we did not pretend to make something traditional in a, nostal in a nostalgic way. So we decided to use for this kiosk the idea of the traditional ironworks in a contemporary way and to combine it with bronzy plates. The ironworks in the kiosk will remind us also the blacksmith's uh, work and will help, uh, will help so the bronze was not stolen, you know, it was a problem in the city. <laughs> the idea of using bronze uh, came up uh, in addition to our own interest in the material because it recalls us of the, golden, of the gold used in the interior spaces of some churches, but at the same time made us remember the work of a very well-known German artist, uh, Matthias Geritz, uh, that I suppose uh, Maggie Peredo talked about yesterday that came to our city in 1949, leaving a profound artistic legacy through his work as professor in the architecture school and recently founded in those years. So other collateral references are uh, these typical doors used by Luis Barragan in the city, known as Abras, probably seen in his trips to Africa. As the, same, uh, as the time uh, went by, we realized that the prototype kiosk uh, may be used for different purposes. So we developed um, some variations for the openings for attending different needs, for example, to serve as a traditional groceries selling points. That is a reason for having a double prototype when the public space needed to provide some more uh, services. 
The prototypes just got installed in a, in a couple of squares in the city, are not open, uh, they are not open to the public yet. Uh, but we hope that very, that very soon we will, uh, that will be in service to be able to observe their interaction with the intense urban activity. Uh, this is a, probably the largest commission that I had working for the municipality um, in Guadalajara. It's about the recovery of a park in the north part of the city. It is a work of a, it is a work in fact of a larger team where I was the designer in chief, mainly for the built structures and the landscape general criteria. The place is known as Wentitan Park, uh, as it is just beside the Wentitan Canyon, a huge topographic and environmental element that in fact has determined not only the natural ecosystem of the city, but also has defined the historical human settlements, uh, the city limits and many other things. The park had fallen into neglect for different political and social reasons because it's a zone uh, in conflict for problems caused by real estate speculation uh, and some other social problems. We found the place with insecurity problems uh, because of the abandonment and lack of conservancy, but it also had potential at, uh, as it had an important vegetal heritage. The most important uh, fact we found was that the place, no matter how many problems had, it was in use by the inhabitants of that part of the city. The place was known for serving as a jogging track for many runners, both professionals and amateurs. So the first part of the work consisted in having a series of meetings with the neighbors and the community to define together the program of necessities and the design aspects. One of the first actions uh, we made was to trace the new jogging track as it was the element that, that keep the place alive for many years and of course because it was a political promise uh, made by the mayors as his campaign. That was a perfect excuse for us, for Andrea and us, um, to know the place by walking and to find certain landscape features to make the project feel rooted to the natural uh, preexistences. We recall this kind of actions that, uh, like Michael Heiser's on your left, or Richard Long's work, as we believe that the landscape is constructed by walking, not only making plans at your desk. Um, so we trace the new track by walking, having in mind the former track, but also adding a couple of detours to produce new places using the existing trees as limits. Another main aspect uh, for the design of in the park was the use of certain kind of a stone. I remember um, when we had the visit of Giorgio Grassi, that I suppose you know, uh, to the city in 2008, uh, an episode which is uh, very important for Andrea and for me, uh, as we consider his uh, written and built work fundamental for us as architects, uh, that he mentioned something a little bit weird, <laughs> that he mentioned about the, remar the remarkable beauty of this typical stone used in the historical city. Uh, in fact, he said something like, you are not so good as architects. Uh, the, the interesting thing in your building is that kind of a stone that is beautiful. <laughs> so uh, that, that kind of stone he liked was extracted from quarries located in that specific place of the city. Um, Despite those queries are now closed because we have no more stone. Um, and that kind of golden stone is no longer available. We decided to use a very similar stone from queries located near that area as an act of displaying the mineral strata of the specific region as a strategy to anchor the proposal to the site. 
for the entrances, we define system of, systems of walls able to produce thresholds to communicate the idea of a special atmospherical change from the city to the park. Those thresholds or uh, selected perspectives, if you want, are very important for us as architects, not only because it's a typical architectural feature, by coincidence, we are now in, in this splendid building by Leon, by Leon Battista Alberti, who helped to define the idea of perspective during the Renaissance. That topic is very, very important for us. But because we have become to believe in the power of the void more than in the power of the object, I mean the architectural object, especially when we are working with the idea of landscape. Those systems of walls, in fact, are the result of the idea of interstice spaces or in-between spaces in the landscape, which can be transformed to meet different needs, uh, as in this main entrance for the park, where the system of walls also allows to have services on it to meet programmatic uh, needs. The monumental heights of the main walls also recalls local examples of public spaces like Gonzalez Gallo Park from the 60s, but in a different way because the use we made of the stone that we believe adds a more natural and set and sensitive feeling. Systems of walls were used for the minor service buildings uh, as well, as in this case, where a stone, brick, and a steel structure houses bathrooms for the use of the community. Those elements are thresholds too, as secondary pedestrian walls can pass through the walls in these tiny uh, buildings. And in relation to them and with existing trees, the new tartan jogging track runs producing spaces, sometimes in the shade, sometimes passages, through the different elements found in place. One of the main structures Design, uh, one of the main structures in the design of the park, as a result of the public consultation we had during the development stages with the community, uh, as in this case, the steel pavilion. We were uh, asked to design a place where many different activities could happen, as informal gatherings, birthday parties, and, or even religious acts. We thought of the pavilions as a, system, as a system that integrates not only a series of columns and beams, but a group of trees aligned in geometrical relation with the pavilion. That is a reason for us to call, uh, to call it as a hypostyle hall, a nasala hypostila, as we recall of those historical types, but in this case, trying to blur the boundaries between the artificial pavilion and the natural group of trees uh, if it is yet possible to name it, to name it like that. <laughs> the blurring between the trees and the pavilion will only be possible when the trees will grow and the shade of both elements will emerge to configure a an unitarian atmosphere. For now, we have to wait a few more years to witness the evolution of the place and the way people will create effective links with the new park, as we believe time is needed for architecture to appear. The next set of uh, two projects are very representative uh, of an important part of our agenda, office agenda, because these projects uh, seek to establish a certain relationship with, between something that we call the industrial tradition and the craftsmanship uh, we can find in the everyday logic of our Mexican economy. And these two buildings are maybe the two more relevant structures in, um, in, our, in the university where we studied. And they have something in common, the, the two buildings that we are showing. They work with a modern classical language and they also incorporate traditional techniques in their building systems. They are representative buildings of the School uh, of Architecture where we both, uh, that we both attended. 
When we received the commission for a, a, a very tiny pavilion in the campus of our university, we immediately thought uh, that we wanted to relate our proposal uh, with the grammar of the previous two buildings that we showed. Using the classicism found in those precedent structures, we worked with a super symmetrical structure not for an ideological reason, but because we wanted to produce a building able to be 100% modulated and dismountable. The building was planned to be a workshop where architecture and design students go there to apply lacquer varnishes uh, for their, their architectural models. So it was needed to be a super well-ventilated space. And we remember about the Galician Orios, which we visited in a trip in Spain and Portugal. And we knew about the efficiency of the, the tectonic facade, sometimes made of wood and sometimes made of stone. The result is a pavilion with the possibility of a ventilating facade due to the use of a system of these wooden louvers that allows the air to flow all the time uh, through the interior gaps. The second level of the structure has a sort of a chimney shaft space, which is ventilated by metallic louvers. In the future, if they need mechanical ventilation, they can install it in that place. So the entire structure can open when, when needed to attend different demands uh, of ventilation or different needs of, of, of use. And finally, about this project, it is interesting for us um, how the, mo the memory works in our minds and how it emerges in, in many different ways. Because in this case, the abstraction of Yasu Yasuhiro Ishimoto's photographic work about the Katsura Imperial Villa for sure had a deep impression uh, on us, as it is a clear re register of how a monumental uh, monument of the past can be present or in a, in a renovated way. In this case, through the lenses of a photographer with a modern uh, education. So Ishimoto's abstraction gave a new feeling to a nation building in the modern era. And we architects of the present learn from a past that is con constantly receiving new layers of knowledge and interpretations. So we think that history is not only a one-way trip, but our present is able to modify also the perception of, of the past. In the past years, we have witnessed a revival in the use of craftsmanship in, in our discipline, uh, possibly driven in part by a renewed recognition and interest in architectures such as Latin American architecture, in which artisanal workmanship is a day-to-day -day event. And although we consider ourselves part of it, we are also interested in recognizing in our own work uh, an influence of industrial architecture, which at least since the 19th century modified forever the way of conceiving architecture. Uh, that is the reason to, uh, to feel close to episodes in history like this one, um, the image that you're seeing here, in which a young Walter Gropius stated the possibility for industrial architecture to be considered monumental. The image shows a fragment of a lecture that he gave actually in 1911 in the city of Hagen. So Walter Gropius referred to a group of silo structures uh, that he found in South and North, North America as buildings that can make us shiver, alluding to their size and presence. Not less known is the episode when Le Corbusier recovered those same images, but he altered them, removing the, the pediments from the silos to make them look even more modern. Another input on industrial tradition uh, that is very important for us is uh, looking at the work of the German, German photographers Bern and Hilabecher. We can appreciate the beauty of the industrial structures where the form and relations of their elements are the result of the pertinence in use. In other words, they are beautiful because of the sincerity of the form, 
where none of the elements, and that's what we think, were added for merely an aesthetical or decorative purposes. It's, it's truly only functional. And the final input in industrial architecture that, that is very important for us is the work of Albert Kahn. And this is um, a particular and a very relevant example of the particular beauty of industrial architecture uh, when he uses a, a tectonic expression. So we sit in the site for an industrial commission. We realized that a set of silos were a particular feature in that urban industrial uh, setting located in the west part of our city, Guadalajara. And far beyond matters of image or aesthetics, those silos made us think about repetition as a recogn recognizable characteristic of the industrial era. So we wanted to propose a building able to communicate clearly the industrial condition of the site. So we decided to work with the typical form of the sawtooth roof, applying a system of variations on it. And you will see those variations uh, on the module had to do with the, the use of every part of the building. That is the reason for the facade to have totally blind surfaces in contrast with other uh, that are more glass proportions. Uh, the system allowed us to make enough variations without losing the sense of unity for the whole building. A major, the major variation happens uh, in the system is, is in the fact that the roof modifies its slope in the east corner in order to respond to the lateral condition of the, of the street, of the plot. This uh, project was built with an extreme low budget and we had to work with the minimum of elements. For that reason, the internal uh, partitions were made using OSB panels and the roof had to be the simplest covering system that we found in the market. But that was not an impediment to, to invite some uh, weavers to work with the handrails in the office area. And thus, we, we think that is, that's important because it's adding, we're adding a bit of local craftsmanship in dialogue with some prefab materials. Uh, this next um, chapter is about um, a contrast uh, with, with these two concepts, the beautiful and the sublime. There are uh, aesthetic categories that we knew because of our interest in relationships of landscape and um, paintings, landscape paintings with the romantic movement. Just to let you know what, what this is about, in uh, 1757, the philosopher Edmund Burke wrote his seminal book, Ph Ph Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful. He defines the difference between something that is beautiful and something that is more related with the idea of the sublime. This book uh, became an important reference for the romantic movement in general, especially for the painters, whom uh, in, a, in a way could achieve his aesthetic goals through the words of uh, Edmund Burke. I propose to read uh, a very short paragraph uh, looking at these paintings that you certainly know. Um, Burke said, whatever is fit in a, any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects or operates in a manner analog to terror is a source of the sublime, that is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. This set of images can at least partially explain the evolution of painting from the Romantic movement to the abstraction in the 20th century. In other words, Mark Rodko paintings came uh, from the landscape paintings by Turner and Friedrich. But what really interests us about these paintings is the expression, uh, power, true deepness, and perspective. We consider them to be a beautiful and slow evolution of the idea of classical perspective 
through uh, the idea of landscape. In 2013, we were commissioned to design an entire industrial facility. The territory where the plot is located is found 45 kilometers south of Guadalajara in the outskirts of Acatlán de Juárez, which is a very little town, which is known to be one of the most important areas of sugarcane production. So it's an industrial landscape. The, agric the agricultural landscape is often interrupted by these vertical sugarcane furnaces. Burning the sugarcane fields is carried out before harvesting, to, uh, be, before harvesting the cane to make the process easier and to require less uh, manual labor. This is a very important landscape feature for us because it's a cultural fact of the site that from time to time determines physically the aspect of the territory. In other words, the territory from time to time is burned. Uh, the commission is about the construction of an industrial facility for a corn grains producer. Once we resolved the logistics uh, of the commission, that had to do with uh, how you place a series of buildings in order to achieve the maximum efficiency in relation with the process of collecting the corn grains from the countryside, how you deliver the grains into the plant, and how you store the grains into silos uh, to be categorized and selected by size, species, color, and so on. We started to imagine how this collection of buildings should be placed to establish a relevant relations with the landscape, the topography, the views, and of course, with uh, themselves as a whole, as a set of buildings. We suddenly realized that all the buildings, because of, of its production logic, were going to have a certain size and presence in the landscape. So we decided to explore uh, the theme of pers perspective as a tool to manage with the scale of the buildings. Their placement had to do with how they collaborate functionally, functionally with each other, but at the same time, we wanted to produce memorable spaces for the people that will spend the whole day working in this place. We learned that we were more interested in working with the idea of the void, again, and between, the, between the buildings more than in the buildings understood as objects that you have to admire for their beauty uh, or materials or precious construction techniques as it is an industrial commission. But uh, of course, we selected a material palette able to establish certain relations with the environment. The, in this case, the cotton steel for the granaries has the ability to react to the climatic changes, the humidity, the morning fog, as in this photograph. It has the possibility of producing a certain drama in relation with the landscape, as the paintings we love, uh, where the nature is the vehicle for the construction of atmospheres and where the void as in this James Ward painting, can communicate the idea of the, sub the sublime with nature. The perspective in the landscape follows the idea of a kind of threshold that invites you to walk. It's the idea of, move of movement. Some perspectives have artificial limits, as the black building you can see on the left. This building is set to divide some production areas and to house a laboratory where they also store the products of the agricultural affairs research. From the distance, the granaries seem to be semi-buried uh, because the work we have done with the platforms to meet the functional needs. At the same time, the production tower can emerge a little bit more over the granaries. We knew from the, from the beginning that the tower, in order to, to house all the machinery and processes of selecting and, and packing the corn, should be a tall structure 
with a presence in the distant landscape. So it was considered by us as a kind of lighthouse in the territory that informs you, uh, among other, th other things, that you are almost reaching the city. It's like, like a Marcia. lighthouse, a tower. We have learned a couple of things by building this project as we have spent many years working on it. It's not finished. We have many other buildings working now. The laboratory, for example, is a building made of generic black concrete blocks put together with the regular mortar we use in the region. But we suddenly, in the process of construction, realized that the sand available in that place for its mineral consistency produced white stains in the concrete block. Uh, this is a very common, uh, this is very common in, in that part of Mexico because the soil is rich in silty sand. So we decided to, for the following buildings, to avoid the use of concrete blocks using instead traditional bricks. And we discovered that by burning the bricks, we could, stu we could stop the appearance of white stains. That uh, technique has been applied, for example, at the entrance building, a traditional brick bolt folded roof that rests into a stone mound as a kind of land art, if you want to gesture. The mount is, a f is for us a landscape type. Mm -hmm. This is a particular and personal way of proceeding for us because an architectural element meets a landscape feature forming a hybrid, a hybrid new element. The roof collects rainwater and is meant to irrigate the mound uh, we hope it starts to grow wild vegetation as a result of a natural process found inside instead of planting something, you know, beautiful flowers and everything. Um, well, finally, the last chapter. Uh, the sacred and the profane is a well-known dichotomy proposed by the French philosopher. I don't know if you have heard from Mircea Eliade. And he refers to the manifestation of the sacred into the human or natural world. Um, Mircea coined the term hierophany to name this manifestation of the sacred that is revealed as something profoundly different from the everyday life. And while we were working on this commission that Alejandro just explained, uh, the founder of the company actually, he passed away. And this enterprise is a family, a familiar company. So we decided to propose to them a memorial for him in the campus. And they immediately said, please, yes, we want to have a space for him, right? Um, so we designed this uh, garden memorial, which is, um, is a new approach on the same theme of perspective, but with a sensitive change in the scale of perception. Uh, in here, the, the act of walking has a different um, speed to the use of the gravel and the elements of the memorial. So it's, you walk and it's slower, you have to slow down a little bit. The first element is a, a minimum enclosure only for, for one person, for an individual. And we call it a roofless room made of a stone, which is conceived as an echo chamber uh, to try to catch the sound of the water flowing from the ground. That way, the water course describes different phenomena uh, related to water, such as the sounds, the reflections, the brightness, and so on. The second scene, which we call the island, is a place made by a stone pavement, and it has in here a small lavender garden that you can see on the left uh, with a single bench. And the way in which we understand the dialectic between the sacred and the profane, or profane is in how an industrial architecture is uh, proposed as a programmatic hybrid capable of accepting uses or activities that in principle could be understood as not compatible, right? You have an industrial campus, but also you can have a memorial or a monument in the same campus. That means, um, for us, that this, well, in the end, this industrial campus contains a funerary monument, 
and thus this puts in relation uh, two fundamental cults of our culture, one that is death and the other one that is corn. The final element of the memorial is the, the tomb itself. It's a, an excavated enclosure made of a stone uh, retaining walls with a funerary urn which is recessed in the, in the stone wall. This space has an underground feeling reinforced with the water falling into the final reflecting pool, which makes also a sound. And by building this memorial, we realize of something that in fact has become very important for us as architects. At the end, no matter how hard we try to, to behave as builders, uh, concerned with materials or tectonic aspects, we work with human rituals, that's what we think, with culture and other intangible uh, concepts that are far beyond the physical and the material. And we think that the physical also uh, alludes, uh, the physical world also alludes the mind and the spirit. And that's our final thought. Thank you very much.